Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to the World Over Live. We've got a great show for you this evening. First, in Massachusetts, voters are considering a ballot measure to legalize physician-assisted suicide. Here to tell us about it and what it would mean for the state and the nation is the Archbishop of Boston, Cardinal Sean O'Malley. And later... Father Robert Sirico of the Acton Institute and author of the book Defending the Free Market will analyze the big news of the week, including the 11th anniversary of 9-11, the continuing struggle for religious freedom here in the U.S., and the evolving economic crisis in Europe. And finally, the president of the Heritage Foundation, Ed Fulner, is here. He's written a new book, The American Spirit, Celebrating the Virtues That Make Us Great About the True Spirit of America. If you have a comment about tonight's program or would like to send us a question, feel free to email us at worldover at EWTN.com. Let's get right to it. Physician-assisted suicide is currently legal in two other states, Oregon and Washington. The practice is often cited as an example of compassionate humanity. Yet it remains a highly controversial and emotionally charged subject. There is a measure on the November 6th ballot in Massachusetts that seeks to legalize physician-assisted suicide there. Here to discuss his efforts to oppose the initiative, the moral consequences, and the unified efforts of other Catholic dioceses in Massachusetts is the Archbishop of Boston and Chairman-elect of the USCCB's Committee on Pro-Life Activities, Sean Cardinal O'Malley. Your Eminence, thank you for coming. Thank you, Raymond. Let's start with this question two, as it is called in Massachusetts. What exactly does this initiative seek to do or enshrine in law? The, the proposition would allow someone to go to their physician if they have a, uh, the physician would tell them they have six months to live and then they could ask, ask for a fatal uh, prescription and uh, end their life. Uh, and who is driving this? Who is initiating this well, ballot uh, initiative? It's, it's come, I think, through what was called the Hemlock Society, and they call themselves Compassionate Choice now. Mm -hmm. the, the same group that uh, uh, brought this about in the Northwest is now trying to bring it to the Northeast. And, mm -hmm. of course, we're very worried that uh, if they prevail in Massachusetts, then it's going to spread to other parts of the country mm -hmm. as well. So we see this as a, not just a crisis for us, but for the entire country. And now, that's Cardinal why O'Malley, you, you've read the arguments, you've heard the arguments. Uh, those advancing this ballot initiative say this is a compassionate option for people who are at the end of life, they're suffering, they're hurting, and this is a way for them to end their lives with dignity. You say what? That ending your life by suicide is not a compassionate nor a dignified way to die. Uh, we in our Catholic tradition have uh, Mother Teresa, for instance, who in the slums of Calcutta went and picked up the dying and carried them on her back and in a wheelbarrow mm -hmm. and back to an abandoned temple to take care of them so that they could die surrounded by love. Mm -hmm. and. Unfortunately, a lot of this is being driven by uh, the desire for autonomy. Uh, they, even those who propose this legislation admit that it's not a question of pain so much as having complete control over the end of life. Uh, modern uh, medicine is able in practically every case to control people's pain, to make them comfortable at the end of life. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's this terrible individualism of our culture, this autonomy mm -hmm. that uh, makes people feel as though uh, they want to end their own life so as to be completely independent of everyone else. And yet, as, Amer as a human beings, we are so interdependent. Mm -hmm. And in a human life, at the beginning, at the end, we depend on others. Yeah. We're supposed to be a burden on others yeah. at that time. And at other points in our life, we're the caregivers. We're the ones taking care of the babies and taking care of people in their, mm -hmm. in their end stages. Now, some would say, 
The problem with you, Your Eminence, the problem with the Catholic Church is you want people just to go on living forever and a day, on respirators, on machines, on and on and on. That's not really the Catholic that teaching. Is, that is not to the Catholic teaching. Explain it. Although me. I'm sure that many people feel that that is true. Mm -hmm. We believe that at a certain point when people are dying, it's all right to let them die. Mm -hmm. But causing their death uh -huh. is something very different. Uh, and therefore extraordinary means and keeping people uh, alive artificially. The church doesn't uh, require that at all. It is not required. In fact, it would not be recommended. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's quite different from uh, killing someone at the end of uh, life. Let's get into the circumstances uh, under which this ballot initiative would apply once or if it is enshrined in law. Uh, it would apply to terminal cases, people with terminal diseases. And there would be apparently a, a counseling physician or the referring physician would have to determine if this person is of sound mind and identify them as having a terminal disease. What's wrong with that? Well, first of all, uh, the physician would have to forecast they have six months to live. And we know that physicians more often than not are very wrong about those kinds of predictions. Uh, the other thing about the legislation, it doesn't say whether the person will have six months to live uh, if they don't go under any treatment or they have six months to li live because there's no treatment that could save them. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of ambiguity uh, just with that aspect of it. Yeah. The other thing is there's no requirement to have any kind of psychological uh, evaluation to make sure the person is really of a sound mind to be able to make that kind of decision mm -hmm. on their own. Uh, very often, and 50% of the cases I'm told of people that are diagnosed with cancer become clinically depressed. And of course, mm -hmm. someone in clinical depression can, can become, can, can be mm -hmm. suicidal, of course. Mm -hmm. there, now, there is a clause that under what is called consulting physicians, where it does say specifically state licensed psychiatrists uh, to make sure that the person is not impaired. Is that satisfactory in your mind? I'm told that in the studies from uh, Oregon show that one in 70 uh, consulted with, with a psychiatrist, psychologist before they were euthanized. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no requirement that they consult with a, with, have a psychological before they undergo or sign on to this uh, No requirement. Regimen. There's no requirement either of, you know, informing or inv involving the family. A person could do this completely uh, surreptitiously and, and the family would find out afterwards. Yeah, the identification, it, 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 the way it's written, it suggests that the individual can make this decision, but then it's very odd because in the next line it says, or a family member, a friend, or someone else can interpret the pa patient and decide what they're trying to communicate. That seems very dangerous territory. Well, particularly in today's world, we've become so aware of the dangers of elder abuse. Mm -hmm. And very often, that is perpetrated by a spouse or adult children against a very vulnerable elderly person. and. Mm -hmm. uh, so th these kinds of situations are, are rife uh, with uh, possibilities of, uh, of terrible abuse. What unintended consequences do you foresee taking place should this become law? Well, besides uh, promoting suicide, mm -hmm. at which is such a terrible scourge in society, uh, it does undermine human dignity. Uh, it encourages people to end their life uh, violently. I, I call this violently mm -hmm. by poisoning themselves. Uh, and it would be a pill that would be administered. They would well, sign or on. Or a series of pills uh, that they would, would have to take. They have to ingest this poison mm -hmm. that uh, is, would be lethal. Mm -hmm. So it's not an injection. It would actually be a, a pill that one would have to administer yes. oneself. And, and uh, as I understand it, very often it would take several, a, a large jar of medication uh, for mm -hmm. them to, to take. And, uh, you know, how about the, uh, the pharmacist that doesn't want to fulfill the, this kind of a, a prescription? Uh, 
And I'm told now in, uh, in Oregon, uh, they're trying to force the doctors who don't want to participate in this to make a referral. Because it's on the books. You know, so uh, the, it's just a very insidious uh, uh, expression of the culture of death. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can have such uh, wide uh, repercussions in society. And uh, Are you concerned with the national health plan that we see before us and rules still to be written, et cetera, the implications that this could have the financial uh, incentive that could come into play for both the state or individual families to encourage a sick individual to proceed down this path? It could, you know. I, I, it's difficult to, to forecast all of those things, but this would make it possible for people to, to use this kind of a law with those very nefarious and mm -hmm. uh, venal uh, intentions. What, what happens to the Hippocratic Oath? What happens to the do no harm and conscience protections? I guess th 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 they'll be set aside if something like this were to be. Well, the Hippocratic Oath, not only does the physician swear that he will do no harm, but it says very specifically, and will not give uh, a lethal drug to anyone even if they ask for it. I mean, it's, it's a blatant violation of what has been at the heart of the practice of medicine, it, it, this would corrupt the medical profession mm. uh, in, a, in a very alarming way. And so we see this as, as a, a very important uh, uh, spiritual battle for us. And we're asking mm -hmm. people to pray. We're having a, a, a novena of rosaries. Uh, mm -hmm. It is the month of the rosary. And uh, and we would ask all of those watching on television to join us in prayer. And what are you all doing as a series of dioceses, four dioceses in, in Massachusetts? What programs, what steps are you taking to oppose this law? Each of the parishes has a, a coordinator, and we've had a series of um, uh, uh, workshops throughout the state. Mm -hmm. uh, we do, we're using the television and the radio, uh, and we, as I say, have this novena of prayer uh, in the Archdiocese of Boston. We will uh, be doing a video uh, homily. I'll be preaching to all the Catholics of the diocese. I did one already uh, in February when this was announced, and we'll do this again. We're trying to encourage people to, uh, if they're shut-ins or elderly, to to get uh, absentee ballots so that they can weigh in on this. Mm -hmm. We need everybody to, uh, and we've also, we're er, cooperating with other churches, with, with Protestants and Jews, and uh, asking all people of goodwill to, to stand with us on this. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, a lot is going to depend on our ability to get the message out. And that's why we also need, help from our viewers to, uh, to go to the website and there they'll see how they can uh, contribute to be able to, to help us. And the website and is stopassistedsuicide.org? That's right. Now is that a diocesan web website? No, no, this is, no, this is a, a committee of a very broad uh, base committee of people from different mm -hmm. churches and, and different persuasions who stand together in opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, of this. The polling on this has to be daunting from your perspective. It is. It's uh, very when you look at this in March, Your Eminence, 43% were in favor of this ballot initiative. The most recent polling, a PPP poll in August, 58% mm -hmm. were in favor of this ballot initiative. How do you change that number? And I'll, why is it so high? I'll, well, the over half the population of Massachusetts consider themselves secular. Mm. And that demographic overwhelmingly favors this. And that is why we have sort of a two-pronged approach. We're, we're trying to catechize our Catholics on end-of-life issues to help them to understand and to mobilize them. We're also trying to point out, as you'll see on that website, the flaws in this uh, legislation that would 
convince people who perhaps don't have any religious persuasion that this is bad legislation and will be harmful mm -hmm. to people. Uh, so we need to uh, to ask people to make sacrifices and help us to get the message out there to be able to to bring more and more people on board. We have to to convince uh, a large segment of the voters, but uh, our message is is right and. I'm sure that if, we, if they hear our message, uh, we will be able to convince them. There are no doubt a good number of people watching the show tonight. We have people across the spectrum, some people with no faith at all, but they tune in because they're sort of interested by the back and forth. What do you say to those who look in and they say, that's fine for you Catholics to believe that this option of physician-assisted suicide is a moral evil and therefore not acceptable. But don't deny us the right to have that and exercise that choice in our own lives, what argument would you make to them? I would say that what they are advocating for is suicide, and suicide is, uh, is an evil in our society. And we cannot say we're working to prevent suicide and then helping to poison people because they're in the end of life. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever is watching, whether they're believers or not, I'd ask them to look at the website. We're there, we discuss a lot of the shortcomings of this legislation and hopefully things that would help people who don't have any religion at all to see that this legislation is not going to be good uh, in a world where there is so much elder abuse, in a world no. where uh, what we really need to do is to all come together and work for better palliative care and end-of-life services to, to help people to die with dignity and surrounded by love as, as Mother Teresa was trying to show us in the streets of Calcutta. Yeah. And in Oregon we see the passage of physician-assisted suicide. The suicide rate has gone through the roof in a decade since that's passed. And if you see what's happened in Holland, uh, you know, the the latest legislation that's been proposed, a report in the New York Times in April, uh, they're trying to start a program where a team of people go out to euthanize people in their homes mm. and the service would be available not just for people with serious illnesses, but anyone over 70 years of age could ask for that service. It's, it's, it's macabre. It's chilling. It's, it's, it really it, is. It, I mean, it seems like it's something out of, out of Edgar Allan Poe, but it's unfolding. And in states, in the United States, here, where people thought they did That's why it's so important for us to stop it in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. If we don't stop it there, it, it will be in the other states of New England and New York in no time at all. I want to broaden our discussion a little bit. Do you see this ballot initiative on physician-assisted suicide as another front in this religious liberty fight that the Catholic Church and other faiths have been engaged in over the last couple of years here, most intensely? Well, it could be because there's going to be a lot of conscience mm -hmm. rights mm -hmm. involved in people who want to resist this if it does become a reality here, as it already has become a reality in, in Washington and in Oregon where they're, they're trying to oblige doctors first of all to make referrals where that would be against their conscience. Yeah. I can see they're going to oblige uh, uh, pharmacists to, uh, to provide people with these lethal drugs. This would be against their conscience. So I, I, I do see that this is going to put us on a collision course with the state. Yeah. Uh, talk for a moment. In 2006 you made the decision, and I know it was a heart-wrenching one, to take the church out of the adoption industry or the adoption business rather that it had been a part of for more than a century and that was because the state was compelling you to adopt children out to unmarried couples particularly same-sex couples you you bowed out of the industry and business a, a business that the church was doing better than anybody else incidentally mm -hmm. uh, after all of this time do you see that happening to Catholic hospitals, Catholic clinics, and other Catholic institutions vis-a-vis -vis this, uh, this ballot initiative? Well, this is certainly part of, <laughs> of a whole. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the more that uh, our rights to practice our religion, to live our faith, uh, are restricted, 
then the more difficult it's going to be to maintain the institutions that we always have to serve uh, mm -hmm. the people. And in the past, uh, in a pluralistic country like ours, mm -hmm. the way that uh, all of these different religions and different groups uh, uh, were able to coexist is through the exemptions. Yeah. And now they're taking those away from us. And uh, yeah. so we're So what do you do? What would you recommend? You're going to be head of the bishop's pro-life secretariat, the chairman of the committee. Uh, what would you recommend to not only Catholic institutions, Catholic small business people grappling with this HHS mandate, should they resist it? Should they fight this thing and just continue on facing the, the possibility of penalties that could put them out of business? Should they take to the streets? What should they do? Well, I think all, all of us need to become more informed on what the issues are and to stand together to resist what, uh, uh, what is happening and to make sure that our uh, legislators and, and people in government understand what the issues are mm -hmm. and what the consequences are. Because I think a lot of people are sort of have been lulled into a, a false sense of security and not realizing uh, the the dangers that, that are out there for us and yeah. but as I say there's also a, a spiritual element of this you know <laughs> some demons are cast out only by prayer and fasting and it's time to fast and, and right? I think it's time to pray very hard and and to and to work very hard to stand together as a church to be proud of uh, of our faith and of the great service that we have provided to this country and that we wish to continue to provide Great. Sean Cardinal O'Malley, thank, thank you, you so very much, much for being Raymond. here. I hope you won't be a stranger. And you'll God bless you. We'll thank you. Look forward to that. You can learn more about the effort to legalize physician-assisted suicide in Massachusetts and the opposition. Visit the Committee Against Physician-Assisted Suicide. Their website is stopassistedsuicide.org. Stopassistedsuicide.org. Up next, Father Robert Sirico joins us to talk about the 11th anniversary of 9-11, which happened this week, as well as the latest headlines when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. My next guest is the president of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. He's a regular World Over contributor, as well as the author of the book, Defending the Free Market, The Moral Case for a Free Economy. Here to discuss the 11th anniversary of 9-11 and the latest cultural news and headlines of the week, please welcome back Father Robert Sirico. Good Father, to be back. Great to see Thank you again. You, Let's start with 9-11. Um, yeah. You are a New York native, and I know this left a deep impression on you. You weren't in the country at no, the time, though. No, I was in uh, Bratislava, as a matter of fact. I had just gotten back from lunch, and I turned um, the television on in time just to see the second plane go into the, uh, was it the South Tower. Mm -hmm. My brother described to me the events. He was um, watching from his home in Brooklyn on the roof of his home. Mm -hmm. He lives near the Verrazano Bridge, so he had a straight shot oh, for it and he said that the it was like the ashes were falling all over the city wow. and um, my niece and nephew were working on Wall Street and just as they arrived in the subway station and went up they saw everything that was happening and went back down in and got the last train back to Jersey Wow so um, it was quite and then when I came back interestingly enough uh, I never changed my flights it was interesting being in Europe at that time too because to be among Europeans, mm -hmm. uh, the warm reception that we had, I was, uh, I had to go from Bratislava to Poland where I was at a conference and they were very sensitive. Mm -hmm. I passed by the American embassy there, then I went to the Netherlands and passed by the American embassy there and then picked up my plane. I never changed my reservations because mm -hmm. in Europe, of course, they never grounded right. the planes and came in to Washington DC where I had to speak but we flew over New York so I actually saw the wow. smoke and then landed and I had to address a gathering uh, at the uh, Pentagon Ritz Carlton mm -hmm. so we passed right by so it's, it was uh, as I think about that uh, very very moving you, you wrote a piece about this which which showed up on Forbes website yes. this week and in it you talk about that we are mm -hmm. people created by God 
uh, to live virtue in freedom, and yes. that that was sort of the message you took away from this. Yes. Explain that a bit, and and the mentality that drove these people yeah. to to uh, crash the planes into the into the trade center. Well, there's such a profound misunderstanding of what freedom is, and I think in a way, 11 years ago, when that uh, that series of events took place, we really thought in that mm -hmm. period of time, uh, what what do we do with our freedom? Because here were, were people who took their freedom and used it to destroy. And the mentality uh, of bin Laden, if you listen to the last um, video that he released prior to his own uh, death, mm -hmm. uh, he was talking about class warfare and freeing uh, the president from the hegemony of these corporations, the kind of language. And I don't know that uh, Osama was a, um, a, a, a Marxist, but I do know that some of the radical Islamists who founded radical Islam, uh, not just Islam, but this right. kind of radical fanatic uh, version of it, uh, did have a kind of Marxist-Leninist approach to a lot of these questions. Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears and talk for a moment about what's happening in Europe. So many of our European viewers l are experiencing such a terrible economic it's crisis horrendous. now. It's the collapse, and you mentioned it in a piece you wrote, it's really the collapse of the welfare state, and, yeah. it, and, and in your words, exposes a false hope. Explain what's happening in Europe as we see the bonds being bought up, all the debt being bought, the Central Bank of Europe buying up all that debt. What are the implications for Europe and the United States. Yeah, well, the um, is it the Prime Minister of Italy, uh, or no, he's the um, head of the, the bank, the Euro Bank, right. the European Central Bank. Mario Draghi. Draghi um, has said that they will buy now all of these bonds without limit. And this is as good as printing money. And the Germans are very sensitive to this because if you simply run the printing presses in order to pay your obligations. Mm -hmm. What you have in the offing is an incredible inflation. Now the Germans are particularly uh, afraid of this, not only because they're going to be the ones holding the, bag. Uh, holding the bag, but because of their own historic experience with the Weimar Republic, which mm -hmm. is precisely what precipitated the rise of fascism. So uh, the German bankers uh, and politicians and, and people, th this will not uh, go well. far, no, it will not go far with them at all. They're, they're quite frightened about it. And it, it's really built on sand because money is not just what you print off a printing press. It has to have some representation of a real value. Mm -hmm. And the moment you start doing that, you, you really then uh, exacerbate the problem. And what is the cautionary tale in all of this for you, the United States, for policymakers in this building behind us? Well, we're only a few years behind them. I mean, we're in a, a situation now where a number of the reports say that by January, we will not be able to get out of this. We will have borrowed so much that we won't be able to get out of it. And then voices that, that come up and, and attempt to really tackle, seriously tackle this, uh, the budget problems are vilified. I'm thinking of uh, Congressman Paul Ryan, who, uh, and, and his idea is to, to, to solve the thing in 25 or 30 years. I mean, it's yeah. not even no, like no, he's going to solve it tomorrow. Well, I've heard a lot of economists here who, who yeah. are people who've spent their lives immersed in the yeah. looking at the federal budget. Some were budget chairman. They looked at, at Paul Ryan's budget, and frankly, they said, this it's, is not no, harsh enough. It's too diluted. No, we need to do I something much more. I mean, all Ryan's more. doing, as we mentioned last week when uh, Bishop Marlino was here and, and, and Professor Schneck, we're just cut cutting the rate of the increase. The rate of increase. It's not even cutting into no. the real budget. So, no. But well, and I don't think we've ever done that. As, as an, We don't cut into the real budget. We cut the rate of increase. So let's talk about what we're facing here. And in your piece in Forbes, you write, the Congressional Budget Office just released a report invoking the fiscal cliff that the U.S. could veer over in January unless it averted a series of tax hikes and budget cuts due to take effect in January. Separately, the latest estimates for Obamacare show that it would cost American taxpayers more than $2 trillion in the next decade yes. and begin with some 18 different tax hikes. What happens yes. when that hits the economy? Well, the same, then we're going to face what Europe is facing. I mean, it's, it's quite an incredible notion to think that we could find ourselves in the situation of Greece. Mm. You know, uh, let me put it this way. The Ryan budget, as radical as people think it is, is simply saying we're going down a hill headed for this metaphorical cliff 
at 60 miles an hour, and we're going to slow it down to 50 miles an hour. Right. You know, and what the Obamacare will do once that begins to kick in in the next decade, if, if it stands, yeah. is to say, okay, we're going to put our foot down on the accelerator and go there even quicker. Let's look at this jobless rate. Um, Mortimer Zuckerman uh, wrote a fantastic piece in the Wall Street Journal, and it reveals uh, we're looking at 8.1 percent uh, unemployment, but he says that number is illusory because there's so many people who are no longer seeking work, 8 million Precisely. of those people, and that the real jobless rate is 19 percent. It could very well be, and there are a lot of economists who, who agree with that. This reflects the hopelessness. The other statistic to look at is the number of people taking food stamps. I forget what the exact number is, but it, it, when you compare it with uh, past enrollment in in, yeah. in uh, food stamps, it's really shot up. So that's another indication of the joblessness. Mm. Now, people will say, you're advocating cutting back and cutting into these social service yeah. programs, and that's an immoral position for you to take. How dare you do that as a cleric? Yeah. Well, uh, what we're not saying You're hurting is, the poor is what they say. That's presuming that these programs are as helpful to the poor as they say they are. Uh, what they're not taking into consideration in part is that a lot of this money that is transferred to programs is really absorbed by the bureaucracy to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it's not if we have a program that is, let's say, $10 million and we transfer that to the poor, it's $10 million that uh, automatically arrives in the homes of the poor. That's not what happens. Moreover, no one is saying, at least I am not saying, that we should do nothing in the face of this. What we need to do is bring up the kinds of programs, uh, the kinds of services that the church uh, created and founded and would be involved in. And my contention is that this would be a great invigorating thing for Catholics to be, you know, when, when people are depressed, I, I also reported on a number of these suicides in Italy mm -hmm. and Greece and elsewhere. When people are depressed, one of the things pastorally I always recommend is for them to help somebody else. It really brings people outside of themselves. Uh, that's one of the things that can be done. And if people are bonding together to help the most vulnerable, and I mean really the most vulnerable, then I think we can transform our society from this bureaucratic mentality, this way of thinking that is doing Europe in, to a, a truly compassionate society. Yeah. Let's talk about Europe as you brought it up again. Uh, there is a move in England, uh, and this is a certain number of dioceses, uh, uh, Arundel, Brighton. The bishops there are suggesting that the laity pray at 3 p.m. as we get into the year of faith, which is upcoming, mm -hmm. pray on the first Friday yes. of every month um, and begin this practice. This dates back to the 17th century. Sure. A good idea? Oh, I think it's an excellent idea. And, and in fact, you know, we used to do things like that. I mean, I, I remember when I was a kid in Brooklyn when we go on every Friday, you know, my mother would get us out of her hair on, uh, in the summer, and we'd be at a pool, a public pool, and every Friday, the uh, people who ran the pool put up a sign that said, Catholics remember no meat in the cafeteria. <laughs> and it was a, a testimony. And these are not a bunch of pious kids. Yeah. But it was a way of witnessing to our faith. It was a way of, and I think this is a great idea. At 3, 3 p.m., of course, our Lord's, the moment of our Lord's death uh, is, is a perfect moment. Uh, the only disagreement I would have is why once a month? <laughs> Why not do the Angelus well, every day at, at noon? Uh, why not, uh, and the, of course, the, well, there are a number of devotions that can be done publicly. Yeah. It doesn't mean we have to but, lay so, prostrate so, in an office. Well, but, we but can the do fact something, is, make when you, the sign of the cross. I'll tell you, when I, I remember my very first trip to Egypt, yes. I had a, I had a, a driver, Mohammed, and we were racing through the streets trying to, to get, there was a UN conference we were covering. Mm -hmm. The minaret sounded. He pulled the taxi over. He said, excuse me, sir, one moment. He got out, grabbed his prayer mat. Yeah. Suddenly, men came from all, from, the, from all the hookah bars and the cafes, mm -hmm. everybody in the street. I'll tell you, say what you want. That's, That's an impressive, impressive it is very impressive. visual. Yes, and is. one doesn't see that in, in no. Christianity or Catholicism. No, no. And we, we used to. Mm -hmm. We used to. Did he keep the meter running? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> he was a he was a driver on the. I he was see. getting paid by the day. I see. Know. Okay. I by the way, the, the, the number work. that I had was uh, four hundred thousand a month were added to the to the, the, to, the, the yeah, uh, yeah. to the food stamp rolls. Right. Right. The food stamp. Let's rolls. talk about this intersection of faith 
and, and the government. We're seeing in with this election year, it seems emotions are running high, mm -hmm. deeply felt concerns about religious liberty are yeah. coming to the fore. Mm. A pastor in El Paso, in an El Paso Catholic Church, St. Raphael Catholic Church, wrote in his bulletin on August 5th, I'm asking all of you to go to the polls and be united in replacing our present president with a president who will respect the Catholic Church in this country. Please pass this on to all of your Catholic friends. Now, he's being apparently investigated now no by kidding. the IRS. <laughs> uh, as is... And the uh, Americans for the Separation of Church and State. Right, Barry Lynn's group. They're which, saying this is... Which has had an ignominious history, by the way, a very anti-Catholic history. Well, I mean, that, that whole group started uh, out of a real animus uh, toward uh, Catholicism in particular. Mm -hmm. So it, it does not have a very glorious... Do, do you think this is a, a, a case where uh, you have I, a violation uh, of the IRS code and their tax-free status should be revoked? Oh, of course not. They're not going to revoke his tax-free status. Uh, the, I think Father was a little too zealous. I think he could have gotten his point across in, in a lot of ways without entering into the specific political fray. You also have to recognize people are not going to listen to, to somebody telling them who to vote for. They want reasons. Give them reasons. Catechize people as to what are the principles involved. And even the bishop's statement in, in 2011 on faithful yeah. citizenship sure. makes it very clear, very clear that pastors should not be endorsing a particular so, candidate. It limits the I, scope of the faith. I would, exactly. I, I was at a lecture once and somebody asked me after I was done, well, are you going to run for president? And I said, no, I have a higher calling. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is the thing we have to remember, that what we're about is something more than the partisan daily mm -hmm. grind. Yeah. These are important things. I don't want to downplay yeah, the importance of these things. But we should not uh, step down from the august yeah. responsibilities that we have. Well, I, I read somewhere... Um, I don't know if it was the Beckett Fund or another group that defends religious liberty, religious expression, and there was a whole dossier on these cases where outside groups ask the IRS to yes. look at the tax-free status of a particular church, not right. necessarily right. a Catholic church. Right. Right. And the, the counter-argument was, wait a minute, in so many of the black churches, you have candidates the, coming in no, there's and a real using tradition. it as a platform. I, I remember when Jesse Jackson ran, they took up collections in the church on Sunday. Mm. Uh, for him, but and th those are not reported. Uh, I think that's a mistake for them to do, as it would be a mistake for us to do. Uh, that's uh, and there are Christian groups who are now saying, "Look, let's challenge the IRS to begin with, because these things uh, shouldn't shouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we should have freedom of speech." I, I think there's a matter of prudence here, and uh, I wouldn't recommend. I want to talk about the Catholic vote for a moment. There's a brand new poll out. This is the uh, Catholic Association poll. They, they polled 2,629 Catholic, likely Catholic voters, uh -huh. 2,629. Uh, when they did so, now they, and they broke it down, they showed you that 50% of these people are regular mass goers, 50% are not. Yet, when you put them in the aggregate, 49% support President Obama, 41% support Mitt Romney. To what do you attribute that? And then I want to talk about the conventions. Well, that's a recent poll. Yep. Just uh, came out uh, earlier uh, this week on Tuesday, uh, or Monday. I think they're on to something, but my guess would be that that has to do with the bounce from the Democratic National Convention. I would give it a few weeks mm -hmm. to see and then do it again and see what happens. What we do know is that active Catholics uh, just do not support the Democratic Party, and you can see why. And I think you're going to go to this next story. Right well, you got yeah, but you've got 49 percent are supporting them now. Yes, a after a convention, which Koki Roberts this week said, and I yes. quote: "Every single speaker speaking of the Democratic Convention, every single speaker talked about abortion. And you know, at some point, you start to alienate people. 30 percent of Democrats are pro-life." Koki right. Roberts said. Right. And she's the daughter of uh, our yes. former ambassador to the Holy See, That's Lindy right. Boggs. Lindy Boggs. Um, of course, not every single speaker, because Cardinal Dolan. Right. Well, he uh, was a benediction <laughs> at the end. He wasn't really a speaker. He was right. pronouncing a prayer. Right. But right. when yeah. you have the head no, of NARAL, uh, the head of Planned Parenthood. Oh, no. Uh, it was, it was uh, mayor quite and, unprecedented. And, and, amazing. Amazing. It's become the sacrament of the Democratic Party. And there are still some, I mean, people like Koki Roberts, who comes from that Louisiana tradition where they're Democrats and they're enough. Catholics. I'm well, sorry. You can I'm invoke, sorry. You can invoke anything, but uh, watch Louisiana. Watch Louisiana. Louisiana. That's right. <laughs> no, but, I mean, there's a real tradition. 
tradition. I mean, my family was traditionally union and, and mm -hmm. uh, Democrat. Uh, but they have driven people out, and at some point they're going to have to really consider this. Uh, what about the, the God flap, where <laughs> God was taken out of the platform yeah. before he was <laughs> ramrodded back, back in? in. Well, I, it was very embarrassing for the mayor of Los Angeles who was presiding over that. Uh, they tell me that it was already on the teleprompter what the vote was going to be. Um, and in fairness, there was also the Jerusalem plank, which was part of it. I don't know right. that that makes it any better, yeah. you know, to, to be doing that. But from the voice vote, at least, uh, the three votes that they took, it seemed to get stronger and stronger and stronger against including God. And by the way, this was not the Nicene Creed they were debating whether they should insert into the Democratic Party platform. This mm -hmm. was just people with God-given rights. Right, or a God passing reference to God. Passing reference, civic reference to God, but it just grew louder and louder and louder. And I think it's an embarrassment. I, I would imagine they want to, you know, kind of switch the subject. You brought up Cardinal Timothy Dolan, yes. his benedictions at both yeah. uh, conventions. Your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I have to say that when he made himself available to speak at the Democratic, uh, to, to uh, pray at the Democratic National Convention, and they declined, I thought, that's a smart move for them, because if he goes there, there's going to be an incident. Um, and in fact, there was not. I, I would love to know what happened, if somebody knows what happened on the floor prior to his coming. If people were warned people not to move, don't throw things. If people were warned not to move, things, because yeah. it would have. Mm -hmm. um, but it, looking at his prayer, they were very similar, hit on similar themes. He yeah, emphasized certain things. Let's play it for people oh, for a moment, yeah, then, then great, we can come. Sure. Go ahead and roll the prayer there from the Democratic Convention. We beseech you, almighty God, to shed your grace on this noble experiment in ardored liberty, which began with the confident assertion of inalienable rights bestowed upon us by you, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thus do we praise you for the gift of life. Grant us the courage to defend it, life without which no other rights are secure. We ask your benediction on those waiting to be born, that they may be welcomed and protected. Strengthen our sick and our elders, waiting to see your holy face at life's end that they may be accompanied by true compassion and cherished with the dig dignity due those who are infirm and fragile. Show us anew that happiness is found only in respecting the laws of nature and of nature's God. Empower us with your grace so that we might resist the temptation to replace the moral law with idols of our own making or to remake those institutions give you've given us for the nurturing of life and community. Uh, Again, very, very, very similar. similar. I mean, he emphasized uh, life there. And, um, you know, the, the language he used, if you read it very carefully, was not intended to be provocative. Mm -hmm. The man was praying. I think he was very honestly praying, and he honestly wants to be bipartisan. He does not want to, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. doesn't want to enter into the, the tall weeds uh, no. of the political debate. But he has this obligation to uphold the dignity of life, the freedom of the church, and oh, the to importance be a witness of marriage. To the faith in the middle of the culture, which is right. what no doubt happened there. Right. And when he said, you know, show us anew that happiness is found only in respecting the laws of nature and, and of God. nature's God. The, these, these are evocative phrases from our political heritage in the United States. I mean, that's, isn't that Jefferson's phrase, nature and nature's God? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think he did a great job, and he's uh, a, a wonderful and winsome uh, pastor. Very good. Father Robert Sirico, we will leave it Thank there. You. We'll look Great. forward to seeing good you to see next you time. Father Roberts, defending the free market, the moral case for a free economy is available at bookstores everywhere and online. For more on Father Robert Sirico and the work of the Acton Institute, visit acton.org. When we return, what is it about America that makes it so great? President of the Heritage Foundation and author of The American Spirit, Ed Fulner, will join us when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. 
Welcome back to The World Over. Is there a quality, a spirit that is uniquely American? My next guest believes there is. He's written a new book exploring that indomitable American spirit. He's the president of the Heritage Foundation here in Washington and author of the book, The American Spirit, celebrating the virtues and values that make us great. Here's my interview with Ed Fulmer. Let's start with this great book, The American Spirit. In it, you, you, you talk about the values and the virtues that fueled America and that hold her together. Is it still true that there are anything that we agree on, given the, the fractious nature of politics in oh, America? Oh, yes, so much, Raymond. The principles that Brian Tracy and I outline in there, I think, are still held by the overwhelming majority of American people, no matter what their day-to-day -day political attributes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're patriotic, we have faith, we believe in freedom and optimism. We're, we're one people, and I, we want to stress the positive. What do you think is the greatest threat facing these values and virtues that you lay out in the book? Uh, overreaching government. Mm -hmm. A government right now that is trying to eliminate all the intermediate institutions mm -hmm. between the individual and the family on one side and the federal government on the other side. Mm -hmm. And that's what really concerns me as I look at our country. Now, you talk about the American dream in the book, and you spend some time talking about it. Um, why is that phrase so important, and this notion that one can climb up from nothing and progress beyond where your parents were in the last generation? It's important because it is such a uniquely American kind of story. Mm. I've studied in the UK. I, I know what the class system is like. Colleagues of mine whom you know very well, like Dinesh D'Souza. Yeah. Uh, grew up in India where wherever you were born, by gosh, that's, that's where, where you're going to end live. up. Yeah. But here you come in, you've got a clean slate, you can do whatever you want to do. My old friend Jack Kemp used to say, the neat thing about America, provided somebody doesn't cut the bottom two rungs off the ladder, is you can climb as high as you want. Mm. And that's what makes it such a neat place. Mm. Are, are we in danger place? of losing that American dream? A lot of people think it's over. It's a myth. <sighs> or they've tried to make that argument. They make the argument, but fundamentally, and you and I, as we travel around the country, I think we see it. It's still out there. Sometimes it gets a little repressed, and, oh, the so-called mainstream media says, well, this is not the trendy thing to do. So people in Columbus or Elmhurst, Illinois, where I came from, oh, well, we're going to kind of suppress that a little. But it's still there, yeah. and it's still alive. What is the core belief system that holds this together? You spend some time in the book talking about faith. Yeah. What was the faith that the founders envisioned when this started? And does that present difficulties now being a huge multicultural country that we are today? Remember, when we were started, and they talk about it in the Declaration of Independence, about how we're endowed by our Creator. They and even in the Bill of Rights, when they talk about freedom of religion, they don't talk about freedom from religion. They talk that there will not be a church-established religion, but that, yes, we do have faith. Because, frankly, if we don't have faith, where do these rights come from? Mm -hmm. do, they, do they come from government? Somebody at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or over here across the street in the Capitol? No. They come from a divine creator, and that's, that's what holds us together. Yeah. Have, have this idea of rights shifted? Have our understanding of what rights are given to us and what rights we should be accorded shifted over the ensuing couple of centuries? Yes, very much for so. For the better I mean, or the, the worse? Probably the last hundred years for the worse. Mm -hmm. uh, the progressive movement certainly has talked about rights that we're entitled to, mm -hmm. and they try to redefine those in terms of what the government can give us instead of what we can earn for ourselves and, and how we can uh, climb that ladder that we just talked about. Some say the American experiment is finished. It has played itself out, and that China's on the ascendancy, we see other countries moving in, and that America has seen its last great days. You don't believe that, do you? I don't. I don't at all. I'm an optimist. I'm fundamentally, uh, uh, you know, going back and, and kind of converting an old phrase, I'm an America firster mm -hmm. because, by gosh, this place is so special. It's so unique. I get to China a couple times a year. I know China. I, I know the UK. I know Europe. Be in Europe next mm -hmm. week, in Germany, and in the Czech Republic. And Oh, our dear friends in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, who've, what they've gone through. But by gosh, we've got so much more. We've got so much more 
not only in potentiality, but in reality today. I, I want to shift back to faith for a moment. Why do you think there's such a hostility in recent years to this notion of faith that, again, the founders envisioned when they, when they drafted the Constitution, it was part of their rebellion against England, protecting their religious freedom and their liberty. Why the hostility today, do you think? Because those who are hostile to it are trying to set up a new set of values, a new set of institutions that, that will replace the old mm. ones. Again, eliminating those intermediate institutions between the individual and government and replacing them with a new, a new subsidiary of government, if you will. And this goes back to the progressive movement and how people uh, view uh, government by experts instead of a government of the people. Mm. And here... You know, you look at it today, and I go back to Ronald Reagan, you know, trust the people. And that's what we talk about in the Declaration, in the Constitution, and, and it's, it's, it's still really a unique place. You knew Ronald Reagan. You worked with him. You certainly yeah. also uh, know uh, Lady Thatcher. What do you think they would say to the, po political, to the politicians that are doing combat here in the United States, and um, what, would, what do you think would be their advice to each, to members of both parties? Uh, they would say, uh, stick to the basics, get back to first principles. I had the great honor, again, of being with Lady Thatcher. We have our endowed Thatcher Center at the Heritage Foundation. I was with her just three months ago in London. She's not seeing many people, sure. but she talked to me about she said, you know, tell my friends over there in Washington to stay firm, to stand up for what they believe in. You know, she doesn't keep up to date with sure. what's going on day to day, sure. but she still knows what's right, and she's still in there. She's still fighting. Still engaged. Yeah, you have been nice. the president of the Heritage Foundation for 35 years. Wow. Now, this started as a little think tank here in D.C., and it's risen to become one of the most preeminent. What is the secret to your success? We believe in a certain set of principles. We've stuck to those principles. We haven't deviated from them. And one of my fundamental beliefs is if you're going to be successful, you have to add and multiply, not divide and subtract. Mm. And if you can bring people together and find, again, go back to Reagan, find that 80% we agree on today, let's take it, and then we'll go ahead, and then we'll find the other 20%. Mm -hmm. We'll fight about that later. How has your faith, your Catholic faith, helped you navigate the waters here in Washington and allowed you to survive as president of the Heritage Foundation well, all these years. Well, this is a tough town. Yeah. It's been absolutely fundamental. Uh, grew up in a very traditional cradle Catholic family. All three of my mother's brothers were Catholic priests back in oh. Illinois. So the faith was really a part of the family going way back. Mm -hmm. Then go off and be confronted at the University of Edinburgh, where I did my Ph.D., going, going to church on Sunday and seeing on the wall of the cathedral in Edinburgh, down with popery. Hmm. My gosh, you know, I thought yeah. this went out 200 years ago. Yeah. But it's still there. There it was. I mean, and it's... Uh, so this town, uh, they don't like people to talk about it. And I, I tend not to wear, wear my faith on my sleeve the way some of my friends do. Yeah. But by gosh, it's the rock on which... Uh, Linda and I have, have been together now for 43 years and had our wonderful kids and now our grandkids, and it's, it's what really holds us together. Yeah, it's, a, it's the animating force in your life, and yes. you see it in your work as well. Uh, in the book, you also, one of the, the pillars you describe of this American spirit is personal responsibility, something we haven't talked about. Have we lost a concept of personal responsibility, particularly as it applies to the social safety net and, and, um, and the way in which we try to help people get back on their feet. Well, Raymond, as you know, at, at Heritage, one of the things we do every year is our index of dependency. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the incredible increase in the number of individuals who are reliant on the government for this program or that program, for this or that uh, different kind of, uh, of, of subsidy. And, that's not what America has been about, and we, we hope we can kind of get away from that, too. Yeah. And again, this goes back, though, to this intermediate institutions, the principle of subsidiarity, going yeah. back to our faith, sure. where at our local Catholic church, you know, soup kitchens and working with our own is the way you do things. You don't wait for Washington to come up with a plan or a program. And, and 
in the meantime, you help individuals. Mm -hmm. You don't talk about aggregates of how many million people are doing this or that. You talk about John Jones around the corner or Susie Smith down the street who we can yeah. actually make a difference with. Human beings, human to human contact yes. rather than yes. this kind of faceless charity or faceless. Yeah, we are individuals. We're not a class or a group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm Why should about. people read the American spirit, particularly now on the eve of this big election? They should read it not only now on the eve of the big election, but they should read it and and take it to heart and talk to their kids and their grandkids about each of these different ideas because this is what animates us as a people. We didn't write it as a political tract. Mm -hmm. We wrote it as the unifiers. Again, mm -hmm. those 20 principles that really bring us together as a people, not something that divides us. It's not a political tract. It reminds us that we should be optimistic. We should have faith. The rule of law means yeah. everybody's treated equally. All of these things come together, and that's why it's such an exciting book. The American Spirit, Celebrating the Virtues That Make Us Great, is available at bookstores everywhere and online at the usual outlets like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And we want to remind you to join us this weekend for EWTN News live coverage of Pope Benedict XVI's apostolic visit to Lebanon. Live coverage begins on Friday, September 14th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time with the Holy Father's visit to St. Paul's Basilica in Harissa, Lebanon. Visit EWTN.com. Look under Television Specials for more information, including re-air times. You can always count on EWTN to bring you Pope Benedict wherever he travels. And that is all the time we have. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Go to RaymondArroyo.com. The Twitter and Facebook pages are linked on the left-hand side of the site. Like me on Facebook or follow me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo. Let me know what you thought of tonight's show. And starting this month, the World Over Live re-air times have shifted a little bit. The show still premieres at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Thursday with re-airs on the following day, Fridays at 1 a.m. and 9 a.m. Eastern Time, Sundays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, that's a new time, and Mondays we remain at 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, go to the World Over page at EWTN.com. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Royal. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye now.